Good evening. Is there life out there? Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, there's life in Cape Town. Thank God for that. We're here. So first of all, and most importantly, I guess, thank you. Thank you for choosing to spend some time this evening with me. Thank you for investing your time and energy in an event like this. And thank you most of all, particularly those of you that I've known for a while, or those that I have not known but have given me the confidence behind the scenes to actually get my ass into gear and write this dreaded book. And the process of writing a book is an interesting one. And it's not one that I'd embarked upon before. It's not one that I had intended to do at all until I met some bloke called Rich Mulholland for a really shit lunch somewhere. And he twisted my arm and said, Ian, you just need to go and do this. You've got some time on your hands. Just write down what you think you should write down. So that perfectly bound little bundle of joy that's either in your hand or under your chair right now is no academic textbook. There is zero research in that book. And if you think there is, I'm really sorry for having misled you and got you here tonight. That's my bad. What is in there is the distillation of over a quarter of a century of running very large pieces of organizational machinery to get shit done. And the observations over that 25 years or so of how difficult it is to get things done never ceases to amaze me. So I've written it down, and you have it in front of you. And you may think that some of it's useful. You may think that some of it's absolutely pointless. But what I want to share with you this afternoon, this evening, is some thoughts on something called fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic sits at the heart, as far as I'm concerned, as to why organizations, businesses, groups of people fundamentally don't get as many things done as quickly as they should there's a very, very big set of issues that create something called fuzzy logic. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a hot point, 6210 front-loading machine drum washing machine. It was the pride and joy of hot point in 1978. The very latest version of the washing machine. It was delivered to my parents' house in a very large lorry. My sister and I were playing out in the garden. There was a series of summers in the late 70s in the UK that had become legendary, hot, dry, dry summers. We were outside playing, and this big truck rocks up. Now, we lived in the middle of nowhere. Sheep outnumbered people 100 to 1. Okay. We didn't get trucks. Okay. This is pre-Amazon, pre-Take-A-Lot, remember. Two guys get out of the truck. They lumber this great big enormous brown cardboard box out of the back, and they bring it with great ceremony into the house, into the kitchen. And slowly, they take the cardboard off. And inside, there you have it, your beautiful, beautiful hot point, front-loading machine drum automatic washing machine. They took out the old twin tub that loaded from the top that had seen my sister and I through many, many nappies and many changes of clothes over the past 10 years. And they put this one in. And they started to explain to my mother how to use this hot point, 6210. And I eared in, because you know, eight, nine-year-old kids do that. They want to know what their parents are talking about, right? And has got kids here, you'll know that. But you drift in and out of conversations. And he said the following. This hot point, 6210, has a computer inside. And it delivers something called fuzzy logic. Now, here am I, eight or nine years old, growing up on the then Tom Baker version of Doctor Who, and the recently released On the Wireless, or the radio, series of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, when people are talking about computers. I've got a computer in the house! And better than that, it's got fuzzy logic. <laughs> yes. Fast forward. Fast forward about 12, 15 years later. And I'm in my first ever real meeting. 
And my first job was with a company called Ford Motor Company. Heard of those guys? Yeah, they make cars. <laughs> there was I, 21-year-old graduate trainee, in my first meeting in an engineering plant surrounded by a lot of very grumpy white men, broadly old enough to be my grandfather. And we were trying to solve what I thought was a very straightforward problem. It really was very straightforward. And we sat there for two hours in something that they called, wait for this, a steering committee. I had never, ever heard those dreaded words before. But barely a day has gone past since when I haven't had to be in a bloody steering committee. So this steering committee of seven or eight very experienced people took a very long time to make absolutely no decision whatsoever. And I'm sat there thinking, but this is really easy. You just could do X, Y, and Z. And it was my first example of corporate or organizational fuzzy logic. The last time I delivered the set of annual results for a large organization, I stood up in front of the analysts, the journalists. You stand up in front of the employees, the shareholders, and you say, Something along the lines of, we'd love to reassure you that we've invested your money really carefully. Every decision thought through to the nth degree. Eight decimal places was a rounding error for us. We've been through this. We've got this. We've got your back. What a great set of results. Very few CEOs or chairmen tend to stand up and tell the truth. And a more truthful statement would go something along the lines of, yeah, it's been a normal year. We made some compromises. We dumbed down to the lowest common denominator on most of the debating chambers that we had, because I couldn't get Xcode to agree. So-and-so got really grumpy when we took that project away from us, so we changed our mind again. And broadly, the year was a failure compared to what we could have done. But that's what most of us are thinking when we stand up on a stage like this and give our annual results. So where is that distance, the arc of distortion between cause and effect? How do we get all these really bright people together, like in that Ford Steering Committee, and not come out with a set of results that make sense and are as good as they should be? And I believe there are five or six very specific things that happen in any business, any large group of people, any large organization, when they get together to make decisions. Firstly, and probably very critically, there's the issue of what I call in the book the experience overhang. The majority of leaders, the majority of people get to their position, become important in an organization or community. They rise above their peer group because they're slightly better at something than somebody else. I mean, it just stands to reason, right? It's how you get to the corner office. It's how you start to command control and respect and everything else. But as you get there, you start to believe your own bullshit. Trust me, I've done it. <laughs> and you start to think that the same behaviors and ways of thinking that got you to that position of seniority are the same things that will keep you there or take you further. So very specifically, let's come back to Ford, a company that dominated the automotive industry along with its peer, General Motors, from the 30s right the way through to the 70s and 80s. Those leaders that I was with in the early 90s had made their money, their fame, and their fortune and become senior working in that industry, in that environment, before the oil price crisis, before the Japanese came along with smaller cars, before consumers changed what they wanted. But every time we were making a decision, they were still hanging on to the things that we'd done in the past, the experience overhang, to influence the decisions that we were making today. And it's just not relevant. And in fact, there was a cartoon that's so that did the rounds at Ford by the fax machine in those days. We didn't have email. Right? And we put our IP, rest in peace Ford, and underneath it, we've never done it like that before. Because that's all you ever heard from the old guys. We've never done it like that before. <laughs> the experience overhang stops us being sensible, thoughtful, and disciplined around a lot of the thought processes that we have. If you then combine it with a very, very straightforward tendency that people like me like people like me. 
people who become senior, people who start to generate control, people who start to run and lead organizations, will very often hire in their own image. Some people call it the shadow of the leader. There's a fancy Greek word for this thing called homophily. People like me like people like me. But what happens when you do that is you get lots of people who think the same, lots of people who behave the same. They start, again, either believing their own bullshit or not being able to challenge the wisdom that's going around in the boardroom at the moment. And this isn't about whether you're white or black or male or female or young or old. It's not a diversity issue in that sense. It's about the way that you think and behave and do things. And I fell into this trap. I was talking to somebody earlier today, and I was saying, I remember building up one of my first teams in the late 90s in the banking industry. Brand new team, built it from scratch, hired 18 people who I thought were the bee's knees. We were rocking. We were making stuff happen. But we were creating what my boss referred to as a ghetto. A group of folks that just got stuff done, but not necessarily in the best interests of the wider organization. So they thought I needed some help. And you always know that you're in trouble when your boss says, I think I need to invest some more management time with you. It's not a good thing. Okay. So a guy comes in, he says, right, this is very interesting. We're going to run some kind of organizational psychology profiling nonsense. And it's still around today. They call it Myers-Briggs. And it has four kind of dimensions too. And there's a few nodding heads of some of the older and more mature members of the audience here. I discount happy in that one. And um, sure enough, of the four quadrants, three of those were identical for all 18 team members. All 18 of us were actually thinking, behaving in the same way. Now, we were a different age group. We had different racial backgrounds. We, it doesn't matter. The fact that we're thinking the same stops the challenge. And if you stop the challenge, your logic becomes fuzzy. Then you dial on top of that my experience overhang, which is a problem. Okay. I've now got an issue with people like me, like people like me, and then we've got politics. Politics, politics, politics. How often have you heard in any organization, any water cooler, any coffee machine, well, he or she was in a bad mood, it's their pet project, and you know, the politics got in the way. People write books about politics. Now, an arch politician of our generation, certainly on the screen here, could tell you exactly how it's done. But the reality is that politics just keep on getting in the way of every sound, sensible decision that you're trying to make in a large organization. On top of all the other issues we just talked about. Now let's layer something else on. Why not? Because we can, right? We have going on in every organization today, in every business that I've ever come across, the sunk cost pity party. Try saying that when you've had a few glasses of Baxberg at the back. The sunk cost pity party. Now, any accountants in the room, don't be shy, just put your hands up, I won't hate you forever. Any accountants in the room? Oh dear. Okay. Now, the accountants in the room will tell you that sunk costs are just that, they're sunk. We can do something about them on the balance sheet, and they're not supposed to influence your forward decision making. To which I reply, okay, I get that. That's why I wasn't an accountant, but I, I get that. But the reality is that your sunk cost as somebody who works in an organization is not necessarily just a financial one. It's the emotional time. It's the sweat equity. It's the amount that you have put into a pet project or getting something done. And it, then it doesn't work or it gets shelved. But we just cling on to the thought, maybe we could resurrect it next year. Maybe it will come through. So we cling on to the mistakes that we took a long time making instead of just letting go and refreshing the brain and allowing it to think differently. So it gets in the way. And then it gets worse. Because as you become more senior, as you become more comfortable in your job, you start to believe in yourself more and more. And the balance to get, the, to get between arrogance and confidence becomes really tricky for any organization. You want leaders to be confident, but they need to be able to listen and respect the views of others. Let me give you a really simple example. I am absolutely convinced when I get behind the wheel of my car that I am the bastard love child of Ayrton Senna and Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> I'm convinced of it. I can kiss the apex of that corner more tightly in a more balanced way earlier on the power than anybody else in this room or anybody else on it. I'm convinced of it. And that is just 
in the school car park. But it's real. You start to believe you're that good. People keep telling you you're that good because you've just hired a load of people who are like me, right? People have stopped thinking because they assume you've got the answers because you're the boss. You've got the experience overhang of the things that got you there to become successful, but you're no longer able to think your way through the challenges of tomorrow. So fuzzy logic, if you ever want to understand an example of fuzzy logic, then talk to this guy. Anybody know who he is? Stephen Elos, you got it. Nokia, 2014. Press conference, go and find the YouTube video. Never pretty to see a grown man cry, particularly when he's in absolute denial. He says, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. No shit, eh? <laughs> but why did Nokia lose? Because they fundamentally fell into every single one of those fuzzy logic traps that we've just talked about. They were incredibly arrogant. They dominated their space for 10, 15 years. The people that had led them there were still there with the same behaviors that had been successful in 1995 when the rest of the world was wanting a different form of connectivity in the palm of their hand. They were going to stop making phone calls just now, I remember. They had a shed load of people in senior positions right across the organization who thought like, behaved like Stephen Eloff. They hired lots of people who are like me. And they had so many sunk costs into so many failed relationships like the Microsoft challenges they had, they wouldn't let go of the bad mistakes. So Nokia is the perfect case study of fuzzy logic in very real action, very, very recently. And there are lots and lots more. I firmly believe that fuzzy logic is real. But I don't want to leave you today going home feeling totally, totally depressed with only another glass of Baxberg Merlot between you and jumping off the harbour wall. Okay. There are some things that we can do about it. And if we start to look down the other end of the telescope at some of these issues, I believe there are four very specific things that we can each of us do and as organizations that we can learn from that will make a genuine difference to the challenges. Firstly, and very straightforwardly, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Embrace reality and make it your friend. We ain't going to get rid of fuzzy logic anytime soon. But if you know it's there, if you're able to understand that it's real, then you're taking the first major step forward in being able to change your behaviors and address the issue. So firstly, embrace the reality and make it your friend. And then start to understand how do we create a culture in a business where we fail fast, we fail early, and we fail forward. What does that mean? It means being able to allow people to learn in a different way. The fear of failure as you become more senior in an organization gets greater and greater. Your dependency on things that worked in your past life to be successful in the future gets greater because you don't want to be seen to failing. Trust me, I've been there. It inhibits your natural reaction. Somehow you've got to be able to create an ability for people to feel comfortable with trying things out in a different way, quickly, without fear, and with an ability to actually make things happen. And if you get that part of it right, you can genuinely start to develop a culture in a business which is about innovation. Innovation doesn't mean having a large research and development department. It doesn't hang around a whole group of pointy-eared engineers in a dark room with cold towels over their heads coming up with great plans. That's not innovation. That's research and development of the clever stuff that I don't understand. Innovation is about a group of people all the time thinking about how they can do stuff differently, what they can do that will make a difference to their project, to their product, to their customer that will change. But you ain't going to get a culture of innovation in a business if you're allowing a lot of those aspects of fuzzy logic to stay there. So being having the confidence to fail fast, fail early, and fail forward starts to liberate people's brains. It was Jack Welch who said many years ago, for years and years and years, we hired the arms of people, we hired the legs of people, and we hired the backs of people. But never once did we realize that their brains came through. Yeah, it's true. We do it all the time. So we've got to be able to create a way of innovating. 
And we've got to start to create businesses that allow people to move around a lot more. The accepted wisdom in so many human remains, sorry, human resources departments. <laughs> Freudian stuff. The accepted wisdom in so many HR teams is that people need to be in a job for a year to learn what's going on, a job for another year because they're getting their feet under the table, and finally in year three, we're getting a bit of output. By which time, you've fallen into all of those experience overhead issues, you're doing everything that people used to do in the past. We've got to create more musical chairs in businesses. Diversity, stopping people thinking in the same way the whole time, behaving in the same way the whole time, requires us to do things differently. One of those is be much more structured about how long people stay in jobs. Now, I'm not saying this applies to everybody. I would be deeply uncomfortable if next week I went to see my dentist and he told me that last year he was a vet and tomorrow he's going to be a brain surgeon, right? I mean, it doesn't apply everywhere. But the ability and the imagination to create a different metabolic rate to the way in which we move people around is a critical way of breaking out of it. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, triumphant diversity will beat organizational adversity. It does. And again, I'm not talking about diversity in a race, gender type of way at all. I'm talking about different types of people thinking in different ways with different experience sets that will help stop some of those fuzzy logic traps in the first place. Triumphant diversity beats organizational adversity. But how many businesses have we worked in that have done something about that and made it happen? So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. My firm belief is that there are four things to take out of today to stop yourself jumping over that harbour wall. And secondly, be very careful in the car park as I'm driving out. <laughs> thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy tonight.